Um, this is going to be close to a purely clinical talk about super rare diseases, um, and I'm going to go really fast. Um, this will be case-based, and uh, it's always good to talk about what you're not going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about smooth muscle tumors, and if you don't live in my world, then I have to tell you about what's not in my world. I will not be talking about high-grade undifferentiated endometrial stromal sarcoma. I will not be talking about carcinosarcomas, and I won't be talking about low-grade endometrial stromal sarcomas. So those are a different talk. Um, but I'm going to be talking about smooth muscle tumors that live on this kind of spectrum from um, intravenous leiomyomatosis with metastasis to the lung, benign metastasizing leiomyomatosis, stump tumors, leiomyosarcomas, if there is such a thing as a low-grade leiomyosarcoma, and high-grade leiomyosarcomas, and how do we tell the difference and how they behave. And I won't have all the answers. I let Rob review my slides so I didn't say anything really stupid with the pathologist in the room. But basically what I think about is that the weirder they look and the more necrosis you see and the higher mitotic rate, the worse things are. But it's probably a spectrum of disease and not individual categories. Um, so we'll start by cases. So here's a 41-year-old, and she has benign leiomyomatosis in her myomectomy. And so that should be a benign disease, right? But six months later, she has vaginal nodules that are, enlar uh, that are enlarging, and she undergoes hysterectomy, and her ovaries are taken out. And she has an estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor positive, smooth muscle actin marking um, tumor with a low turnover, less than 5% on the key 67. Outside, they actually, despite the SMA, uh, I'm sorry, the SMA was negative. So outside, they called it endometrial stromal sarcoma. And when we reviewed it here, we said, no, this looks like intravenous leiomyomatosis. And so you can already see that there's confusion, you know, there can be confusion and difficulty in making these diagnoses. Um, but uh, somewhere, she belongs somewhere in this spectrum of these smooth muscle tumors that have this uh, spindle cell features, but relatively bland appearance and a low mitotic rate. And even though you would think those would hold still, they can definitely travel, and you can have recurrent disease or metastatic disease um, basically anywhere. So what do we do for these women? Most of these women are in their reproductive years. The time until they come back can be very, very long. Um, and it's very important that you um, compare the path side by side when you see recurrent disease. Benign metastasizing leiomyomatosis is often seen in the lung, but it can be close to anywhere and probably somewhere in medical school. You saw the case of the IVL when it um, progresses all the way up the inferior vena cava and climbs into the right atrium um, and it involves very extensive surgery. So at least from my point of view, though the women are in their reproductive years, I at least consider BSO at the time of diagnosis. I try to remember that these are, though they can metastasize, they're low-grade diseases, so metastatectomy usually has a role in these cancers. For unresectable disease, it's reasonable to think of hormone blockade, and yep, we ought to watch them, and probably close to forever, but no one has defined exactly how long or what type of imaging. Um, it's fun to think about a familial syndrome that can be seen with leiomyomatosis. Um, hereditary leiomyomatosis with renal cell carcinoma prevent, uh, pre may present with cutaneous leiomyomas and is associated with the development of papillary renal cell carcinoma. This is an autosomal dominant um, disease but with incomplete penetrance. Um, it's associated with a mutation that enc encodes um, fumarate hydratase. And there are some relatively typical histologic features that um, have been described here and elsewhere, and patients are, are generally pretty young. Um, it's very reasonable to consider genetic counseling for these women and um, even think about screening for renal cell carcinoma. If, you're, if they're under surveillance for recurrence of their leiomyomatosis, then you're probably imaging their kidneys. So what happened to this woman? So this same woman that had the leiomyomatosis, she uh, um, had no metastatic disease despite that vaginal recurrence that was resected. We got a third opinion on the pathology because of the difference between the outside ESS, and we called it IVL, and we um, planned to um, watch her, which we did. And she actually has had now a second recurrence. This time was a port site recurrence in her abdominal wall that's been resected and is the same pathology. Um, it's still BML. So kind of moving uh, to the next group, I think I lost my picture, um, on this continuum, 
uh, we were going to talk about stump tumors. So smooth muscle tumors of uncertain malignant potential. Um, are, I'm going to illustrate that with this second case. So this patient had a super cervical hysterectomy and the ovaries were left in in 2006 and it was called a stump tumor at the time. Um, and, in two, and then four years later has recurrent disease in the pelvis. After she's resected, there's no evidence of disease. Um, that 2010 recurrence is a pretty big tumor, six centimeters, um, and the mitotic rate is lowish by mitotic rate, although the MIB-1 rate was 30% in some areas. Again, hormone receptor positive, and two immunohistochemistry markers are done, P16 and P53, both negative. And the pathology report actually says in the comment that this looks like very low-grade leiomyosarcoma with a very low risk for recurrence. And it's good to remember that with the spectrum of disease and these long histories, we have the benefit of the retrospectoscope. So when we see recurrent disease for something that used to be stump, then it may swing us a little bit more towards calling it leiomyosarcoma. Even if the histologic appearance may not have changed too much, we still have the benefit of history. So what do we do for her now? She's had this recurrent disease in the pelvis that we, we resected, but it still seems awfully low grade. Should we do any kind of intervention or just watch her? So I elected to watch her. And this is what happened next. She's, uh, two years later, she starts to have jaw and ear complaints, which I'm sure have nothing to do with my disease, but we get her an MRI of the brain. And she has a petrous bone lesion that, <laughs> everyone says, looks like it might be leiomyosarcoma, which I think, I cannot believe that. And so I say, we're going to need to biopsy that rather than just radiate it. So she needs brain mapping to get the biopsy. But sure enough, by 2013, we get her biopsied, and she has this atypical spindle cell neoplasm. The morphology looks like 2010. It's SMA positive. It's ER positive, And it's metastatic leiomyosarcoma. So, could I have known that from the beginning? And is there a way to know which stumps are good stumps and which stumps are bad stumps? So the short answer is we don't know for sure which stumps are good. People have tried to um, subtype the stumps into the ones that are good risk, the ones that are probably not so good risk. Um, and But you can see that the numbers that these recurrence rates are based on are pretty small. Maybe, like I talked about at the very beginning, seeing tumor cell necrosis is going to be a hallmark for badness. The mitotic rate, maybe not so much. And atypia, it's hard to say. Um, if we look at stump outcomes, and again, we're talking small numbers of tumors, but in one re retrospective study looking at 16 cases of stump, and of which there were two recurrences, and you try to look at them, and I color-coded it from the last slide. So here are the ones that were supposed to be pretty good. Uh, these are the ones that are supposed to be pretty good. These are the ones that are supposed to be pretty bad. These are the ones where we don't know. The two recurrences came from the re we don't know group. So it's a, still going to be a little hard to sort out. Um, and then other tumors, this is the same series, um, other tumors had only focal staining for the P16 and P53. I'm sorry, the previous slide, the suggestion a bit that maybe those would, the P16 and P53 would be the hallmarks of the bad stumps. But the short answer is probably not so much. Uh, so bottom line, I think that necrosis is bad if you see it on your stump report, and mitotic rate is probably bad-ish if you see it on the report. It's hard to know about P16 and P53. Um, what I tell patients is that histologic review by smart gynecologic pathologist is critical, and that the best part of the stump name is the U for uncertain, uh, and <laughs> because I am really uncertain. So, what happened with this woman next, um, she actually, the MRI after the biopsy showed increasing size, some central necrosis. She was with displacement of her carotid artery, and so she was radiated and has now been followed and is um, clinically doing well. So this is sort of a segue into the low-grade leiomyosarcoma thing because, you know, this was a stump and then it metastasized and we started calling it low-grade leiomyosarcoma. So, does such a thing exist? 
retrospectively, sure. This is a series from MD Anderson comparing what they called low-grade smooth muscle tumors or sort of low-grade lyos to high-grade lyos, and they can say, oh, yeah, the low-grade patients, they're younger, they recur in, recur in the pelvis more than they do in the lung, they live longer, it takes a long time for them to come back, and their survival rates are good. So that's all great retrospectively. The question is, is there something about lyomyosarcoma when I look at it under the microscope on the day of diagnosis that tells me which team this, per this person's going to play on? And the answer is I don't really know. The standard criteria from, uh, from Stanford for diagnosing lyomyosarcoma says that I need to have tumor cell necrosis and a certain mitotic index um, and some atypia to make a lyomyosarcoma diagnosis. Um, but that doesn't necessarily tell me exactly how that lyomyosarcoma is going to behave. So, um, so so I can just tell you by one brief illustration that low-grade lyomyosarcoma exists as a behavioral entity. And so here's a, I should put this on a timeline so it'll be cuter, but here's a patient who definitely has had high-grade lyomyosarcoma, and we have had multiple resection opportunities to make that diagnosis, and she has yet to see one drop of chemotherapy alive with disease for 14 years with multiple recurrences, which we've been spot welding or resecting. So she's got low-grade disease, and I, but histologically, she looks like high-grade disease, and the thing is to just be aware that that can happen. Um, okay, so kind of moving on to high-grade disease. This is high-grade disease, metastatic, big tumor burden, symptomatic. Um, we have a nomogram to say that uh, this particular patient will have a poor outcome because of having metastatic disease and high-grade cancer. Um, she had previously presented with early-stage disease some years before, and the question then would have been adjuvant therapy. We have a randomized trial that says radiation therapy won't help her. Adjuvant chemotherapy, a prospective phase two study looked pretty promising at year two, not so promising at year three in terms of um, disease-free survival. And the shortest answer is we don't know the answer yet on adjuvant chemotherapy. We have a global uh, randomized clinical trial looking at gemcitabine and docetaxel followed by doxorubicin versus observation for uterus limited disease, which we, were, we hope will accrue and should give us that answer. Um, so, but for this patient who had met the metastatic disease with the big tumor burden in the lung, what can we do for her first line or second line? We know that gemcitabine and docetaxel are active agents, even as in doxorubicin failures, with about a third of patients having object re objective response and nearly three quarters with clinical benefit. And if you use those drugs first line, you, st you also see a high objective response rate and a good rate of disease control. And some of these response durations can be very um, impressive. The median duration of response exceeds six months, but in some patients, um, they are three years or more out with res um, responses with gemcitabine and docetaxel. And a randomized trial in soft tissue sarcoma, not just uterine lyos, that was stratified by lyohistology versus not lyohistology for all, all comers soft tissue sarcoma. Most patients had had two or three prior regimens. Two drugs were as better than one for response, for progression-free survival, and for overall survival. And sometimes these responses can be great. So this is that same patient that I showed you in the first slide, and after gemcitabine and docetaxel, she is really much symptomatically improved and radiographically improved. Can we do better? Can we add more drugs to gem and dosi? Um, we did a randomized placebo-controlled um, trial with bevacizumab, and the answer is that Bev does not add at all, but in a phase three trial, we can show that the response rate that we saw in the phase two trial still exceeds 30%, which is quite encouraging. Those responses, just like in the phase two, Median duration certainly exceeding six months, really more than eight months um, for duration of response, which is pretty impressive. Um, no difference in progression-free survival. A little uh, clinical pearl from my point of view that came out of that study is that 24 patients who were either stable, responding, or had complete responses said, I'm too tired, I've got too much edema, I'm ready to quit, and they elected to stop active treatment, but we still follow them on study. 
And um, the median time from stopping treatment until they progressed was nearly six months. So this has given me the encouragement to tell patients who are on treatment that it is okay to take a treatment break um, from the cytotoxics. So, um, so what about, uh, what about, what do you do next after gem and dosi for a uterine lyo? Well, I would always consider a clinical trial for them, but I will also, also consider whether the bulk and the pace of the disease met, uh, merit cytotoxic therapy. And we got a lot of cytotoxics on the slide now. Doxorubicin, ifosfamide, decarbazine, terbectidin, pazopinib, aribulin, and new combinations and old combinations. The pazopinib data led to FDA approval based on a randomized trial versus placebo in soft tissue sarcoma. The response rates are low, only about, really, it's 6 percent, um, although the progression-free survival was um, statistically significant and probably meaningful for, for pazopinib versus placebo. Trabectidins is kind of the new kid on the block. Um, the trial in the GOG had objective response rate of about 10 percent. Um, but the median um, progression-free survival was nearly six months, so there probably is some activity in this drug. The newer data were presented at ASCO looking at trabectidin or docarbazine for the L sarcomas. And this study, um, they stratified patients by histology and patients were randomized two to one. It was a big international study that's been, uh, that was uh, intended to file for FDA approval. And uh, this, these are the data for progression-free survival showing that the decarbazine was better, th I'm sorry, the trabectidin was better than the decarbazine for these patients. Um, and secondary endpoints, I really put this up more to show you that even though the objective response rates are low, uh, the duration of disease control um, was actually significantly encouraging. So I don't know what will happen at the FDA, but that was the registration trial to try to get trabectin availability in the U.S. TRAB is actually approved in Europe for the treatment of sarcomas and in Canada, and so I have had patients travel um, for access to that drug. What about co new combinations? I just highlight one, trabectidin and, and doxorubicin. This is a French study showing a high objective response rate, but who knows, is that being driven solely by the doxorubicin? Hard to know in a single arm combination study. So we've got lots and lots of choices for what to do for advanced leiomyosarcoma these days. And the question is, you know, how do you study all of that in a rare disease? We can take this N equals one approach and try to, you know, find the best response to direct in and figure out why she responded and why someone else didn't. Or we can run big randomized trials um, of this group, of this group of drugs versus that group of drugs, but we will not have an infinite number of patients to answer those kind of questions. And how come smooth muscles are so good, tumors are so complicated anyway? Why can't we just find a target and fix things? Um, well, this uh, this is actually. Um, benign disease being illustrated here. So this comes from a study in the New England Journal of Medicine trying to show um, the chromosomal aberrations in benign fibroids. So this is a benign fibroid. So if that's what a fibroid looks like, you, you know, that can kind of put the fear of God in you. You are one mutation away from, <laughs> from slipping on the banana peel into leiomyosarcoma. So how can, we, how can we begin to understand this? So we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of trying to understand what really drives leiomyosarcoma, um, and uh, we're enrolling patients on the IMPACT study 12245 that allows us to try to find the mutations in these cancers. And um, Tara Sumarais, who's, who's in the audience, is really doing most of this work with a detailed clinical annotation of the database. Um, ultimately, if we find uh, good leads, the plan would be to look at in vitro confirmation of the potential drivers uh, to show that they are the drivers for developing the leiomyosarcoma. And this is just a screenshot of the kinds of things that we can turn up from, uh, from the C-Bio portal when we profile an individual person's tumor, so that, that's like, oh, great. We can do stuff with P53 and pick 3 ca mutations in a lyo, um, but it gets more and more complicated. 
And uh, here is an illustration of one patient's uh, tumor profile from 12245. So which of these mutations should I choose to target for this one patient? I don't think she's going to have a targeted therapy. I think she needs untargeted therapy, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, this is going to be the lead-in for one of the later talks. If she has this many mutations, maybe she's got lots of new antigens, and maybe she's going to be a perfect candidate for immunotherapy. So here's my summary. I have no idea if I ran way over. Um, IVL and BML, are they are benign in appearance, but they are bizarre in behavior. Get a good expert to take a look. Watch the patients. Um, stumps are probably good risk, except the ones that aren't, and it's hard to know which ones won't be, so watch those as well. And uh, low-grade leiomyosarcomas uh, uh, exist. Usually high-grade leiomyosarcoma is a bad tumor, except when it isn't. So you also need uh, great histologic review. Always review the path. Always think about the pace of the disease, and don't let the treatment be worse than the disease. And I want to say thanks to lots of people that everybody that I work with. And with that, I'm going to close and introduce.